everybody is Dr. Rick dropping in on you. I am uh, taking a break in the middle of the day uh, at the gym, um, switching things up a little bit. So uh, on the way there, I'm going to talk about something that I said I was going to sit down on, uh, but I think there's a teaching moment in this thing, and I want to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, before I do, I want to remind everybody uh, to show your love, show your support. If you believe in the work we do, show your love, show your support. Uh, this stuff does not happen by way of osmosis, wishful thinking, uh, or any other magical way. It requires resources and support. Um, and I cannot stress that enough. And so I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, this video that's gone viral circulating with this student uh, swinging on, little girl swinging on uh, a black, black little girl swinging on a black female teacher. Uh, and it has erupted uh, into a major online debate about who's right and who's wrong. And, and so many different things. And as usual, very rarely is this thing critically examined and broken down and the questions asked. And so first thing that I'm going to do is I'm gonna to talk to you about one of the biggest problems we had have. You know, regardless of what topic we're talking about is, one thing I notice is we like to complain, we like to talk about what's wrong, we like to talk about who's doing what. But the one thing that we don't have is the capacity for critical thought. The first capacity and the most, I think, necessary is the ability to ask the right questions. What makes me a great researcher, what makes me effective in what I do in finding solutions is, instead of complaining about something I see I don't like, uh, there it goes. I don't like, I asked why. When I, when I saw that there was a major issue with African-American adolescent young adult male violence, I said, why, where's it coming from? Um, and so I spent years researching it. I discovered five primary components. I created a program to address it, the program works. Thing is, black community won't get behind it in a way big enough to make it a national initiative, but that, that, that's the thing. In every issue we deal with, gentrification, uh, intimate partner violence, uh, discrimination in the workplace, political uh, impotence, every last thing has an answer. Instead of complaining about it, you ask yourself, why is it this way? Why do they do this? Why does this happen? And in the why, you get, you get the direction of your search. You start to find the reason why, because if you find the reason why, you find the origin, you find the source. You find the source, you can address the issue at the source, change the outcome. So one of the things we don't do is we don't ask the question. We don't engage critical thought by asking the right question. So nobody's asking, how did we get from a situation where teachers were respected? We sent our children to school. There was a level of respect. There was a yes, sir, a no, sir, a yes, ma'am, a no, ma'am. Uh, the last thing we wanted was our teacher or our principal to have to make a phone call home to our parents. How did we get from that to the point of children knowing, not only can I set it off in here, if I set it off and you do anything close to touching me, my parents coming up here and they gonna set it off. Now, where it may seem that I'm, I'm going solely on the side of the teacher here, I'm not. But the one thing that we're gonna have to ask is, how can we expect first of all another here's another question why is there this mass exodus of qualified teachers and substitutes in the academic system the public education system we have to ask ourselves that question i've talked about it i've written about i wrote about it in detail in academic uh the academic holocaust uh which is my 20 uh 24th book the academic holocaust. So I talked about this in the miseducation of black youth, my 16th book. So you have to ask the question, how did we get here? 
Number one is we're operating with a system that's, first of all, not even designed to properly educate our children to compete with their children. No one is no one in power is creating a system that will empower the youth of the people we benefit from oppressing. So we're not going to empower the powerless to take our power. And so what does that mean? We're not going to educate your children to compete with our children. So you have to understand your children go to school already with the odds stacked against them. I wrote uh, significantly on the disproportionality of special education uh, referrals and assessments as it pertains to African-American males starting at five years old and how it ties into psychotropic drugs and, and a bunch of other things in these assessments with different designations being given from everything from ADHD, oppositional defined disorder, learning disabled, and so many other things, many of which, uh, especially oppositional defined disorder and ADHD, can be medicated with uh, uh, Schedule II drugs like Vyvanse, Ritalin, Concerta, Adderall, all of these things are Schedule II drugs, highly addictive, very little medicinal use. Okay, so we talked about all these things. These are the questions we ask. So we ask, in this particular situation, the first thing we got to ask is, how did we get here? Second of all, what do we expect in a situation where there is a shortage of teachers, especially African-American teachers? And God forbid you're looking for an, a masculine heterosexual black male to be a teacher. They are damn unicorns right now in the academic system because we allowed them to be run off because we did not have a level of appreciation for their presence because we allowed the system to totally uh, not only alienate them but alienate black males, period, including the students. But we get to this point where we're talking about this little girl who had her phone taken. Now, there's an argument that children should have their phone taken. I am somewhere in the middle of that. I think that a child should be allowed to have their phone. I think that the, the rule should be that the phone has to be on vibrate so that it does not disturb any other children. I think that we have to have some level of accountability. And the last thing you want is a situation where you got everybody's phone and something pops off and nobody can't call for help and you and something happens to the teacher now you got everybody scrambling trying to get their phones to make calls and this is a real reality a possibility in today's educational environment right so i think that there has to be some give ground but also as parents if i don't want my child to operate under a rule that says they can't have their phone and they can't have it out during class, then I have to be selective on where I send my child to school. I can't send my child to school understanding that there's a rule there and then get upset when the rule is enforced. Second of all, tell me one place this child is gonna be able to grow up and go to work and earn a living as an employee or business owner where they don't operate and abide by some form of rules. The ability to operate by rules, I'm, I'm talking specifically about respecting another environment. When you create your environment, you make the rules. He who has the gold makes the rules. When you get the gold, you can make a bunch of rules. I've changed so many different rules of engagement as it pertains to me and the people that I do business with because I have the goal. I have what they need. And so I can sit up and say, I'm not wearing a suit to this meeting. And they're going to have to be okay with it if they want what I have. Maybe they want a suit more than they want the type of quality uh, services that I offer. That's up to them. But I get to say that. I get to choose the ground on which I stand on because I went out and got the gold. But there was a time I had to abide by the rules. I had to abide by the rules until I achieved a certain level to where what I was seeing was valuable enough for people to look past their biases, their ideas of what is, and a whole bunch of other things. But when I was in school, I abided by the rules. Matter, matter of fact, school was my safe haven, but then we had teachers who cared. We had teachers who weren't just there for a check. But what happens is we ran those teachers off. We ran those teachers off. We pushed those teachers uh, 
you know, we push those teachers off to, you know, other places. They're, they, they've they left the educational environment completely because we didn't respect them. We didn't pay them. Uh, and, and we unleashed our unruly children on them. We got children swinging on teachers like it's going out of style. This is not an isolated incident. So then we got to sit up and say, at what point? And then we also have to say, this was a substitute teacher. So number one is she doesn't have the uh, requirements that a certified teacher has. Um, she doesn't have uh, the training. Uh, she's there to fill a space because there's an empty seat. The either the teacher is out for a day or the teacher is no longer in that classroom and it's just one of many classrooms that don't have certified teachers in them because people are leaving the profession. That's a problem. But I told you this was going to happen when I wrote my 16th book, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America. I told you this was going to happen. I told you it was going to be a problem. I told you that we weren't going to be able to use this system to effectively educate our children anywhere. But here we are. So since we're here, let's talk about this. Now, I, I'm not advocating for someone to be able to go haul ham in on a child that's smaller than them. But there has to be a level of respect. And kids, let me tell you something. We've been so headbeat on this idea of morality. This idea that everybody does what's right because that's how people are. People want to no, people do what's right because they avoid, they want to avoid the consequences that come with doing what's wrong. There are those people out there that do what's right because it's right. Most people do what's right because they don't want to deal with the consequences that come with what's wrong. When there are no consequences for ill behavior, we get what we have now. There are no consequences for so many different things that are going on in our society right now to the point that people are in a hedonistic, antinomianistic state of mind where nobody cares about anything but what they want. And when that happens, you get chaos. And so what you have in an academic system is a bunch of kids that don't respect the teacher and you're sending a teacher in there to have a kid who doesn't listen. So you get a kid that you sit up, you send them to the room, they do something to violate, they get in a teacher's space, the teacher calls and has them removed from the class. The next day, they're back in there. This is, this is on an everyday basis. This is something when I did my research, this is something that I've done. And, you know, and out of my kids, there, were one, there was one that just wasn't going to do right. And, and when I got called, I made sure I got up there. That was the thing. He gets out of line, call me, I'm coming. I don't care where I'm at, what I'm doing. If he gets out of line, call me, I'm coming. Okay, I'm coming. Now, the thing is, my kid knew. Nobody's going to mistreat you, but you don't get to disrespect anybody. If somebody mistreats you, they're going to deal with me. But you don't get to go ham on somebody and just do what you want to do. That's not going to be accepted. You're going to, you're going to have to deal with me if that's the case. So there has to be these consequences. I personally feel the teacher went overboard and I didn't see this myself because I hate watching this stuff so I saw the beginning of the video when the student hit the teacher and the teacher started to go toward the student flipped off, not knowing this was going to become this big thing when I saw it. I don't know. I'm not going to watch this violent book. This is so, and it's so freaking common. So what happens is from what I understand, the teacher eventually gets the little girl down and sits on top of her. I have a problem with that because she could easily suffocate her. We've seen what happened with, with, with just a simple knee in your back and pressure over time. So I have a problem with the way the child was restrained. Uh, I, I, but I think that what we also have to look at is how many times the principal, I mean, the teacher called down to the office and asked for assistance while this was going on and no one even answered the phone. 
again, we put them in impossible situations and we're asking them to sit up and make magic happen. The goal for sending our children to school isn't to send them there so somebody can babysit them. It's to send them there so they can be prepared. There's no way your child is learning in that environment. So you should be concerned about it. So maybe we need to start really talking about what I've been talking about for a long time is creating our own edu uh, educational mechanisms. Homeschooling is working out what I sit up and said. I did this for a while myself. It advanced my kids and got my kids through a difficult period when, you know, they, they were going through some things and it prepared them. It got them on track. Let me tell you something. And I, I, I'll admit, I, I wasn't the best at it. It takes something to be a fully committed homeschooling parent. But what I'll tell you is, what it did is it gave me control. It just showed me just how much more control I had over my child's education when I'm actually educating my child. I'm setting the parameters. I'm setting uh, the priorities. I'm saying what's important. I'm telling them what they're capable of. Nobody else is setting their limitations. There's so much that goes along with that. But we have a, a situation where we also are going to have to acknowledge we got a generation of, of kids who don't have respect for adults. There's a generation of kids, sir and ma'am, has never come out of their mind. There's no no hierarchy. There's no respect there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a grown ass man. I got grandkids and there is a, a level of respect I'm going to have for somebody in their 60s. They're not even an adult age span older than me. But there's a level of respect I'm going to have because I recognize them as being older. That doesn't exist in this generation. I believe in liberation. I believe in freedom. I believe in radical shifts. I believe that there needs to be a certain level of pushback in our youth because they need that to stand up and fight against what's going on because the status quo doesn't serve them. I get that. But you can't turn that in on the very ones who are trying to help you. I think we need to find common ground. I think that we need to stop looking for reasons to argue. Stop looking for reasons to turn in on each other. Start looking for the solutions. Again, start asking the right questions. We love to sit up and go at and blame one another for shit. My thing is everything that we see our people doing that shouldn't be doing, there's a cause for it. And nine times out of ten, the stimulated cause has an origin outside of our community. We may be doing it in our community, but it was actually initiated and created outside the community. If you do your research, if you understand sociology, if you understand psychology, if you understand criminology, penology, you understand that this stuff is socially engineered and we're just buying into it. We're buying into it. We're selling all out for it. And it's destroying our communities, destroying our marriages, destroying our children. And we are just going in because we don't know any better. We need to start asking the right questions. One of the things and why I push so heavily for support is this research that we do is opening the gateway to the solutions we need to overcome this. That What do you think the outcome of this baby who thought it was a good idea to swing on an adult? In a classroom setting, what do you think the outcome, if that isn't a serious intervention to where she shifts, what do you think her outcome in life is going to be? And I always end up saying is, look at her do this, look at her do this, and everybody be talking about it, but nobody stood in and stabilized her situation when it was an opportunity. Everybody took a side either against her or for her, and nobody said, hey, do you realize what happened here? Nobody's, and I'm not saying it's not happening in her home. I don't know that, but what I'm saying is I'm looking at the environment around and I'm looking at all the things of how easy we are separated based off of ideas. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm like this. My older kids, because I came out of a house where I was reared by my great grandparents and up until I was like nine, I got whoopings until my grandfather took over and the whooping stopped. And it was just a mutual understanding and a mutual level of respect uh, and a desire to be everything that I could be to please him and make him proud that he never had to do. He never had to tell me. I think he said he was disappointed once. The last thing I want to hear, that was worse than any whooping I could get was to hear him say, I'm disappointed in you. And so I strive to be that. But 
the one thing I say, I got whooping. So when I had my older children, I started out putting my hands on them. But as I got into my study of behavioral science and I understood, started to understand the development of the mind and the development of the human psyche and the development of self-image and the development of self-esteem, I realized the damage I was doing. So I started now, how about I communicate with them like they're a little bitty human instead of treating them like they are chattel? Because that's where we get it from. We didn't do what we were told as slaves. They whooped us. So when our children don't do what we tell them to do, we what? So I'm not advocating putting my hands. What I'm saying is there has to be consequences, though. There are so many. Man, technology has given me so many consequences to give my kids. I don't ever have to worry about whooping them. Give me the phone. Give me the laptop. Give me the game, uh, the uh, game remote. Give me the TV remote. It's just, I can just go until you don't have nothing in your room and you got to earn it back. Never have to put my hands on it. And it also teaches consequences. It also teaches the responsibility of how when you screw something up, you have to gradually get it back. It's amazing when we actually get engaged and involved in our children's lives and expecting teachers to work magic at school for eight hours. And then they have these magical lives. We need to reclaim our responsibilities and our positions in our children's lives so that this isn't a conversation on an ongoing basis. We also are going to have to acknowledge that our, teach, our children are being sent to schools where the teachers who are really capable are gone. People are there getting checks now. The people who really care. We sit up talking about this uh, with a friend of mine uh, a couple of weeks ago. We went to high school together. And we're just sitting up. We met and we talked. And we were just sitting up talking about the teachers who cared. And we had some of the same encounters with some of the same teachers. And we were just sharing about it. And it's amazing how the teachers cared. Then the teachers will pull you to the side when you weren't in their classroom and have conversations with you and challenge you and hold you accountable. They wanted you to be something. That's not out there. Look, get this stuff. You pass, you pass, you fail, you fail. Leave me alone. And they're gone. And obviously there are exceptions to the rule. So on that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here and get in the gym. But I had to share that with you. As I said at the beginning of the video, if you believe in the work we're doing, in research, in problem solving, in program development, in direct engagement, in content procurement, and everything else. Support it. Go to the description box, look in the description box, and show some love and support. One of the ways that's in there. There's at least three ways that you can support us. Uh, do that. On that note, I'm out here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. I'm out. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Thank you.